As a privacy advocate, uh, I would recommend no one ever say uh, that they have <laughs> cryptocurrencies. But what I can say... It's very good. When I was working uh, on the <laughs> sort of great project of my life back in, in 2013, uh, and trying to figure out things like how could I get uh, this archive of material to journalists, uh, how could I persuade them that this is real, that this you know, is practical, how could they see things in a safe way that's uncontrolled, that's unseen, that happens permissionlessly, uh, there's a question of, well, do I need server infrastructure of my own? Maybe the answer is yes. Okay, how do I pay for that anonymously? Maybe, maybe someone like me may have used Bitcoin for something like that. Uh, so I think there are a lot of technologies that we are here. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of technologies that are, we are here for today uh, or that have served our interests in the past that have never gotten the kind of public shout outs uh, that maybe they could have. But when you create new human capabilities, people will use those. And yes, it is true. These things will absolutely be abused. But if we do not believe that people will use these new capabilities more often for good things than for bad things, we might as well pack up the game and say the human race is over, it's done, progress needs to stop, and we need to become less capable as people. Uh, we need to focus not on limiting what humans are able to do. Uh, we need to focus on creating better people, right? And the way we do that is by living good lives, living positive examples, by being good people, right, who touch other lives in positive ways and make them want to be creative, successful, you know, even self-sacrificing in, in certain contexts. Uh, when we talk about which cryptocurrencies are interesting to me, I've said before and I'll say again, Zcash for me is the most interesting right now because the privacy properties of it are truly unique. Uh, we see more and more uh, projects that are trying to emulate this, and I think this is a positive thing. Uh, Monero's out there. I've used Monero, uh, just like everything else out there. Um, and this is, the idea here is you see these little tribal battles yeah. happening in the cryptocurrency space where, where they pick a, a flavor, you know, they pick a team, and it's like a team sport, uh, and whoever uses anything else is the enemy. And this is an enormous mistake because the entire uh, sort of population of cryptocurrencies users is a tiny minority of the human population. And that has to change if you want your rights to be uh, sort of asserted and defended when this gets to the democratic stage of regulation. Yeah. Uh, we need more teams. We need more projects. We need more users. I don't care what your particular allegiance or affiliation is uh, because we already see governments finally reaching the point where they're becoming very, very nervous and moving closer and closer to the point of muscular intervention in how these technologies can be used. And if we do not have broad uh, sort of public familiarity and use, uh, and it's a question of how do we design uh, competing systems uh, that are simply so attractive uh, that they will not be ignored by uh, sort of the global consumer base, but also the governments themselves who are seeking to uh, uh, compete against them will not simply be able to outlaw them and have that be meaningful, right? Uh, and that's, that's a tall order, but when you look at Bitcoin, right, like what are the central uh, benefits of Bitcoin? What are the central flaws of Bitcoin? Uh, everybody is, is focused on the transaction rate limitations of Bitcoins as being its central flaw. Uh, and that is a major one, right? Uh, but I would argue actually the much larger structural flaw, the long lasting flaw, is its public ledger. Uh, that is simply incompatible uh, with having uh, a enduring uh, mechanism for trade because you, you cannot have uh, a lifelong history of everyone's purchases, uh, all of their interactions be available to everyone and have that work out well at scale. Uh, the limitations of how people engage with uh, these, these uh, cryptocurrencies are the, the limiting factor on the sort of apocalypses that we've had from it so far. 
Uh, and it's, I, I think, uh, a, a natural relief of pressure on it. Uh, but I don't think Bitcoin will last forever. And this is something that I, I think will be perhaps less popular with, with some people in the room. But, you know, we need to think about all of the technology projects uh, that we have seen in the past. Uh, the first browser created is not the best browser that we have ever seen. Uh, Bitcoin does important work, and I do think it will have enduring value for a long time. Uh, but particularly when we look at the core development team and their rate of improvement to the protocol, uh, they simply need to do better uh, or they will not be able to compete. And we know encryption works. Um, encryption, like anything else, is you know vulnerable to advances in our understanding of mathematics. Uh, maybe suddenly we know how to factor numbers in, in a way that just simply was not possible before and nothing works, right? Uh, we don't see a road to that now, um, but maybe someday it happens. The thing that we have to deal with in reality, practically today, is we have to build based on what we know. And what we know is right now we can't uh, factor these numbers. These are reliable. And we have real world examples of that. I'm a great case, right? Uh, so we have this giant cache of top secret documents. Uh, that are held by multiple groups of journalists around the world. The New York Times, Der Spiegel, The Washington Post, The Intercept, uh, multiple groups of, of multiple institutions have this cash. Uh, and there are many documents in here that have never been published because as a condition of access to the journalists, I required them to agree to a couple conditions. Uh, the first and foremost of which was they would never publish any story simply because it was interesting or simply because it was newsworthy. Uh, they had to agree that they would only publish stories that they were willing to make an institutional judgment or in the public interest to know. Mm -hmm. They had to make the world better off. Um, but this would, of course, make it a target for you know the, the U.S. government to see what's in there, what sort of secrets they have that got loose that journalists know but didn't print. Other governments, right? Maybe the Russians want to break in. Maybe the Chinese want to break in. Maybe the Germans want to break in and see if anybody's spying on Merkel's other cell phone, right? Um, it's been five years since 2013, and it's never happened. Uh, we know this has never happened because even the NSA's number two official, uh, former deputy director, uh, Chris Inglis, said on camera uh, it had happened the NSA has the penetrations in all of these other governments and, of course, mass surveillance abilities to know. They would see indications that the people they're trying to spy on have changed their methods of communication. Uh, and it hasn't happened, right? Over five years with the world's most well-resourced attackers against a group of sort of well-trained, but let's be honest here, still journalists. It's a bug bounty. If they can protect the world's best cache of secrets, right, for five years against the world's most motivated attackers, what does that mean for the average guy trying to protect his wallet? Pretty good thing. You could break private keys, you could forge transactions, you could do so many things. It's worth so much money now and nobody's doing it, right? Uh, the Satoshi blocks are still not moving around anywhere. Um, but, but the idea when we go back into the, the larger scoping out a little bit about what does this mean for the world when we have this kind of technocratic elite, mm -hmm. uh, will they gain a power that uh, we can't compete with? Uh, the reality is we're already there. Yep. When we look at Facebook, uh, when we look at uh, Google, some of these people like the head of Facebook are already campaigning for the presidency in 2020. Uh, it's, it's quiet, but they're, they're laying the, the groundwork. He went to Iowa. Thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's a very exciting place for Facebook. <laughs> but uh, for for those who aren't familiar with American presidential candidates, Iowa is the sort of very important swing state that they 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 got to start campaigning in. You go there, you talk about. Um, corn. But the yeah, the the idea here is when we have technology uh, and our debates are based on people's knowledge. Uh, and they have an advantage in terms of knowledge, uh, that's problematic. Uh, but it is not insurmountable uh, because fortunately human intelligence is unevenly distributed. Uh, 
Uh, and there are young, smart people in every corner of the earth at every level of the income bracket. Inequality is a serious and growing problem, right? Uh, but I would rather be fighting a battle of brains uh, than a battle of dollars.